It was in two, three weeks that we had more than 250 students joining. So that was over $250,000 in like two, wow. three weeks. We were suddenly like, wow, can That's you even amazing. make that much money on the internet? Like we were really shocked. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Blitz Growth. Really excited to have an amazing guest on today. I think you guys are gonna get so much value. Laura teaches other people how to grow courses, Instagram accounts, and passive income. Uh, she's an expert in these areas, so get ready. She's not only a coach and a teacher, uh, but she also executes herself, having multiple businesses, bringing in tens of thousands of dollars a month. So we're gonna dive into how to do all of these things, um, how to better improve your Instagram, improve your passive income, and work really on growing through Instagram. So Laura, so excited to have you here. Um, I'm excited too. To I, I wish I, everyone could see me. I would be like clapping and cheering, but yeah, very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> okay, so... Um, you have like the perfect topic for what we want to learn about here. Um, and just out of question, like, I know you said you have some corporate background, but how did you sort of get into, you know, growth marketing for Instagram? And then how did that lead on to like courses and passive income? What was the, like the quick kind of like 20, uh, you know, 20 second storyline of, of how you got started and kind of where you ended up? Okay, cool. I can't promise I'll do it in 20 seconds. I'm terrible with those things, but, um, but yeah, to go from corporate to where I am now, I think the main thing was is that um, I was a typical sort of corporate girl. I was a brand manager for FMCG. Absolutely loved my job, but then lockdown hit in 2020, obviously. Um, and I was put on furlough, so I was unemployed, stuck at home. I guess a lot of people, unfortunately, will be able to relate to that. And even today, um, with the crisis happening and to keep myself busy, I thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to do like a bunch of self, you know, personal development things. And one of those things was sharing knowledge online instead of, you know, just waiting around. And so I started sharing my knowledge on Instagram and it was just quite, you know, I would say almost vague, just talking a bit about personal development and things like that. And then I thought, oh, you know what, maybe I can just like help a few entrepreneurs and see if they need some help with like personal branding, start with some beta tests uh, and beta clients. And yeah, from, you know, suddenly a business grew out of that. Like two weeks later, I had five paying clients. Things were going well. My Instagram started growing. And then two months after that, uh, I could finally go back to my corporate job. And by then I was actually having an online business, bringing in over $5,000 a month, which was more than my corporate wage. So I was like, well, <laughs> this is awkward. Um, so yeah, I went back to work to then a few weeks later, I have to tell my boss, like, look, absolutely loved it here, but now I have another business and it's a full-time job. I don't really have time for this anymore. So, so yeah, I just did that for a while coaching. And then after a few months, really, you know, scaled things up to a passive income business and the business that it is today. So that's kind of in a nutshell, how I went from like corporate, like honestly, lockdown, something good came out of it. Let's put it that way. Nice. That's awesome. And I think one learning from that is uh, you can kind of like slowly build your side business. Uh, I think yeah. a lot of people get into this dilemma of like, I should quit everything and do a hundred percent focus on my, you know, side hustle or my courses or whatever it is. But in your advice, for you, from your point of view, is it better to kind of like work on it while you're at another company? And then at the point, as you said, you're making more money from your side hustle. That's when you swap to full time. What's your advice for someone who's kind of in that, that position where they have a job but also a side hustle and when to when to quit the job to focus fully on the side I hustle. I mean, it's super scary to quit your job to go after a business. And I mean, I've been there myself. Even if I was already making some money, I was still worried. Will I be able to do this again next month? And is this going to keep going? So I do think it's it's a difficult decision for anyone. But one thing I would say, the perk of like starting with a side hustle is that you already have income coming in that you can reinvest directly into your business. So if you are, you know, let's say in a job that you don't really love, but, you know, you do have some free time, let's say evenings and weekends, because you are working a lot. And, and ideally, you don't want to stay stuck in that situation for too long, because honestly, I think it's a recipe for burnout otherwise. Um, but you mm -hmm. do have some income. So that means that you could get a coach on an area that you need help with, or you could get uh, a VA or you know, a video editor or whatever it is that you need to make sure that you can start working towards that business. And I do think that being so forced into not having a lot of free time teaches you to really focus on what moves the needle for your business. So you're going to make better decisions and not maybe spend, you know, weeks 
crafting the perfect business cards when that's not actually the game changer for your business, obviously. Um, so, mm. so yeah, I think there's pros and cons to both scenarios. I have a lot of respect for people just quitting their job, cold turkey and going straight into that. Um, but I think sometimes being careful and, 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 you know, first starting a bit with the side hustle and then jumping in could, you know, make it a bit easier to transition. Um, but one mistake, well, mistake, I don't want to call it a mistake, but one thing I see a lot with clients of my own is that some people stay stuck too long in a job as well. They are literally making thousand mm. dollars a month and still working that corporate job. And then I think at some point you do need to, you know, have the guts as well to, to make that decision and go full in because if you're already doing so well with just a side hustle at some point, you know, it is a recipe for burnout. And I do think you need, you know, sometimes a weekend off from your job or, or your business. And yeah, it might be time then to make a decision to switch. Yeah, well, I love the analogy of it being a, like a monkey bars. And as you're going along the monkey bars, you've got to let go of one ring to yeah. uh, swing to the next one. Um, yeah, that's can't a good remember one. where I read that, but yeah, it was a good analogy. Um, that's awesome. So who was your first hire? Um, you obviously did the side hustle, um, yeah. decided to go full time or even hired while you were still at your corporate job, but who was your first hire? It's actually quite a funny story. It's, um, it's a girl that I know since I was born. Um, she's like the little sister of a friend of mine. Um, and she asked to do an internship with me in my corporate job and, basically I had to tell her like look Victoria is her name Victoria I would love to give you that internship but I'm quitting my corporate job so don't have an internship for you anymore and then she told me but Laura actually I didn't really care where you work I just want to learn from you so you know even your oh, business that nice. you're starting can I help you in some way like I just want to you know shadow you for a little while and see uh, what I can you know pick up on because she did like the same studies as me like I kind of had been mentoring her a little bit already through her studies so it's actually a personal connection. And then she started out as an intern uh, and two months later, she was our first full-time employee. I'm saying our, because I have a business partner, our company is called El Synergy. And yeah, by the time we had started that business together, um, she was the first full-time employee and she, yeah, she's been with us two years now. So it's been a nice. while. That's awesome. And then, sorry, let me backtrack as well. Um, let's maybe go into quickly like, uh, the businesses that you've started, uh, cause I know you've got a few, um, and then which ones were they, uh, in order? And then how did you generate your first kind of, let's say, you know, $5,000 in revenue in each business? Cause I know you've got like a quite extensive background. Um, and it's super interesting seeing your progression of the different types of businesses you've sort of created along the, t uh, along your time timeline. Yeah. So, I mean, it's always been the knowledge industry. Um, we, I mean, I started, on my own first with a coaching business. So that's a business that I talked about before that I quit my job for. So it was very one-to-one. -one. And then afterwards I did group coaching as well. Um, I had that business for probably around half a year until I decided to kind of merge with my business partner and create a passive income business called L Synergy. Um, and what we do there is very similar. So we help entrepreneurs still with the marketing side of things. So going from all the way business foundations, content marketing, um, sales psychology. So really everything to build and scale a business online um, with marketing, actually. Um, but we do that now through online courses. And yeah, then we have a few programs within that business, of course. So a few streams of revenue there uh, with a new program actually launching end of the month. So that's quite exciting. Congrats. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of it. And and yeah, other than that, I mean, we still have big dreams for hopefully one day a product based business and things like that. But uh, we're taking it step by step for now. It's been already a bit of a roller coaster. So yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. And then in terms of your coaching, um, and you said you're doing this mostly like one to one first, and then you started being like, all right, let's create a process, let's create a course. Um, how do you sort of like structure this technically? Like your coaching, how do you kind of do that? Do you do that over like Zoom calls, your courses? How do you kind of like set that up? When yeah. did you know that it was the right time to swap from one-on-one -on -one coaching to going like one-to-many and creating a course and being confident that you could sell that course? Yeah. So I started with one-to-one -one simply because I was, honestly, I wanted to start with online courses, but I just didn't know exactly what that course would look like so i felt like i kind of needed to test the waters a bit and start with one-to-one -one coaching um 
I quite, I would say, how long did it take me? I think I did one-to-one -one coaching for maybe three to four months until I decided to do group coaching because I was just continuously mm -hmm. fully booked. So I started realizing, okay, I can't take on more clients because at some point I think I had eight one-to-one -one clients, but you know, I had Zoom calls weekly. I had support by, um, I'm using WhatsApp for that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there, there was quite a lot going on and you still have your own business to run, right? So you're focused on, on, on growing the business of clients, but you still have your own business and your own content and all of that as well. Um, so then and your full-time job. <laughs> yeah, that is a job as well. Um, and then at some point I was like, okay, I need to work, you know, one too many if I want to keep going. And also my revenue was plateauing because I couldn't take on more clients. And at some point I didn't want to keep just increasing my prices. I just wanted to have an extra sort of, yeah, revenue stream, but then just a different format, of course. Um, then I launched group coaching program on top of doing one-to-one. Uh, which was amazing. I I opened up, I think I did nine spots um, because then I worked with little groups of three to have a bit more of an intimate setting um, on top of the one-to-one. -one. So then I had that going on and then I did one round of group coaching until I realized, okay, I actually now know that I can take a bunch of people through one program and get amazing results. I was, you know, sort of tuning down the calls, like doing less calls less often and I was still getting them the same results. So I really took it gradually I think you can do it faster, but for me, it worked very well. One thing I did do from the beginning was have an online course to support my coaching. So um, from day one, I knew, okay, passive income is my dream, location freedom, financial freedom, bring it on, like time freedom, everything. Um, so I just wanted to take it step by step, but I did still obviously have a course from the beginning that I would gather feedback on that course by talking to my clients and on the call, realizing that let's say this module wasn't as clear or they got stuck on this specific problem. So maybe I needed more examples. And it also allowed me to focus on real coaching and, and answering the questions my clients had rather than teaching on a call. I don't think, you know, it's very valuable for a client to just listen to me an hour long talking. I think it's better to have an interaction um, and for me to review maybe even some of their work or whatever they're working on. So yeah, the course was there from the beginning, just kept updating and then just start realizing okay, I need less calls. And then after a while, I just decided, okay, now it's just going to be courses and it's going to be one too many. And yeah, then we launched that. Then I was already in the business with um, Ginny. So the passive income business was with her, uh, is still with her. <laughs> um, and then we launched uh, IVA, which is Instant Business Academy. And it was in two, three weeks that we generated, it was insane. I think we had 250, more than 250 students joining. So that was over $250,000 in like two, three weeks. So that was quite nice because we had just quit our jobs and we're still just happy with a 10K month. So <laughs> this was a very big improvement. We were suddenly like, wow, can you even make that much money on the internet? Like we were really shocked. Nice. And I think one big thing is um, pricing. How did you decide to choose what to charge for your one-on-one, -on -one, your group sessions, and then your course? How do you sort of set the pricing for those? Uh, there's so many ways to do pricing, right? There's people that, you know, want to, it depends on the positioning you want to have in the market. There's people that will go extremely high ticket and they want to have this premium pricing. And, you know, honestly, sometimes clients that pay the least amount of money are the most difficult clients. So, you know, it, there's maybe a misconception around that. I do understand the whole premium price point. But for me, when I started out, I still tried to stay kind of at what's normal in the market. So I just looked at, you know, my competitors, what are they charging? I looked at also my experience level, like what are the results that I can get for my clients um, and, and kind of what they get in return, how many calls with the course and what is kind of the value of the program. Um, and trying to price from there. But I think this also depends on your niche. You know, I know for the business niche, um, it might be different than, let's say, uh, I don't know, if you're a hairstylist, you know, that's a different type of business. So so can't really compare in that sense. Um, but yeah, just like that. And I think for us, pricing, in all honesty, has been one of our bigger uh, blocks within the business. I think we have undercharged a lot in the past. Uh, because we are maybe very pragmatic and small thinking European sometimes as in like, you know, what we pay for education is nothing like what you guys are used to in the US, you know. So sometimes it's still a world that keeps blowing my mind that there's people charging 
$50,000 for a mastermind. It's a world that was so new to me. So we started very, um, I would say, safe with like a course and coaching at like $1,000. And that was already really high ticket for us. Um, I think only now we're starting to realize like, oh, okay, we actually have a million dollar business. We have been, you know, featured in the press and stuff. We can probably charge a bit more than that. Um, so it's been a gradual journey for us. But um, yeah, I would say to anyone listening, learn from my mistakes. Do value your worth. Look at the transformation you're providing. If you are giving some amazing transformations to people and you're constantly sold out, um, you should probably start raising your prices. Nice. Love that advice. So yeah, look at competitors uh, based on outcomes and results. And then also credibility sounds like a big one too. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's awesome. Degrees and, and results that you're getting, like something, of course. Mm. Okay. And then you said you, uh, yeah, it was like around $250,000 with your launch of your academy. Um, how did you sort of fill those 250 people? Um, how did you sort of like find all those customers? Was there a strategy? Was there a build up? What was the uh, kind of work that you put in to get those 250 people? Because I know you don't just like post it once on Facebook and then all no. of a sudden, you know, you have 250 people showing up. What was your I mean, what was your I lead wish. up to to selling out? That would be amazing though, if that was possible. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's not how it went down. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a month of preparation if you think about it, right? It's not an overnight success. We we had been, you know, growing our audience on Instagram for a little while. I think at the time that we were launching, we had 30, maybe 40,000 followers. So, which is a decent, but it also shows you don't need a million followers to make big bucks on Instagram. Just, you know, might be good for people hearing that as well. We have clients that have 3,000 followers and they still make 10K every month. So that's just also to give you some counterweights on that. Uh, but yeah, so we had been growing our audience and until then we didn't have something like a one-to-many offer. We just had coaching and group coaching. So we were constantly sold out. So there were a lot of people wanting to buy from us. So the, the way that we launched was with a wait list because we knew that we had a very warm audience and that people were very much just waiting for us to put something out there like a course. Um, so we put a wait list up, just, you know, had a bunch of people sign up for that. And I would highly recommend pretty much to anyone before you create, let's say, an entire online course, see if there's demand for it. So maybe put like a little landing page where people put an email address so you can already gauge a bit what the demand is for whatever you're creating. So sell before you create is maybe a takeaway here. Um, and then, yeah, through that wait list, we sold through emails um, and also through our content, of course, on Instagram, showing up every day in our stories, having content go out, kind of making people realize, you know, what the program is about, um, having some sales content as well with testimonials from clients, um, making them realize why, let's say, a content strategy is important, if that's something that we teach in the program and so forth. Um, so yeah, and that kind of went on for, I think about two weeks and then we closed the doors, which is also a strategy that I would recommend for your first launch. So you have sort of a hitting of opening the doors to your program and then closing the doors, um, just so you can take it step by step and people can go through the program all at once. So it really helps also the accountability within the program, especially for a first launch. Of course, afterwards you can go evergreen. Um, but that also helped because there was urgency. People wanted to join before the doors were closing and so forth. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. So Instagram following to a waiting list and then emails. Um, I assume on the email, uh, on the waiting list, you're collecting emails and then delivering the the, yeah. the opening via email. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So we, yeah, we then said like, stay tuned. And then the week that we, you know, that the doors opened, we were like, okay, doors are open. And I would also say, be mindful of like fast action bonuses. I think, you know, people always buy based on urgency or price promotions. So you might want to have like an early bird offer of like the first um, 24 hours people can join at, let's say $100 less or things like that. So people really have like sort of that urge to buy straight away because um, they get big results quickly. But especially if you give people let's say a month to buy, it will take them a month to buy. So if you give them a day to buy, suddenly they make a decision within a day. And it, it's, it's all that kind of sales psychology that you do want to 
have in your lounge because it makes a huge difference because otherwise people just see it. They're like, oh, fun. Okay, let me put that aside and continue with my day and they never get back to it. Yeah, I know. I know Gary Vee's a big, big advocate of you fill the time no matter how long it is. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Uh, okay, and so switching over to your growing your Instagram account. So 40,000 people in kind of like the B2B space is quite impressive. Um, you know, what are some... What are some tips or advice to someone who's kind of getting started or maybe got a small following on Instagram? How do you sort of balance between value and business? Obviously, you're trying to, you know, still generate money from all that time that you're putting in because to put in all of that time to make all that amazing content, you need to be compensated. What's some advice or what's some tips for people? Uh, we'll start with the B2B space who want to sell a course. What's how do they use, uh, you know, Instagram? for this uh what's some tips on that okay i think before even jumping into your content strategy always make sure you know who you're talking to who's that target client or audience whatever you want to call it you know what are their goals what are their struggles like really get clear on that person maybe even do some calls with these type of people to really you know hear them talk about their struggles because that's going to give you so many content ideas and help you really define that strategy um then when you get into your content strategy i think Overall, you want to really focus in the beginning to give more value than anyone else. And I know everyone always says give value, give value. But I mean, actionable tips, you almost want to feel like you're coaching people for free on the Internet. That's what we did in the beginning. And that's how we grew quite quickly. I mean, right now we both actually have an audience of 100,000 followers. So it's really always been under that, you know, mindset of, okay, we're just going to like listen and see what people are struggling with and really like jump in on that and f almost make them feel like they're getting coached for free through our um, profile. Because at the end of the day, people are always, especially if you're in coaching, people are always going to pay for um, per like the personalization and the convenience of having the step-by-step -step process. Because a content is only like one little nugget. It's never the entire program. It's still just going to be one concept that you're maybe explaining them. And, and so many people are not going to see it all. And they definitely can't put A and B together and like create a whole program out of that. And the few people that do do that, amazing. That's your biggest fan that is bringing you word of mouth anywhere they go. So I think a lot of people look at social media of like, oh, I need hacks or I need some like next level trends on real or whatever to go viral. But in reality, what you need to think of is social media is just word of mouth on steroids. Like you just want to, Make sure that you impact someone that they have that aha moment of like, wow, I learned so much that they're going to tell their friends or family in these private circles offline about you, show your your profile and, and really talk about you. And that's how you grow no matter what algorithm update there is, because you actually build fans, a fan base that is just, you know, obsessed with what you do and wants to learn more and and wants to let other people know about your value. So I think that is is one of the biggest things that people forget and, and that I would say as a big sort of yeah feedback for growing on Instagram. Got it. So you'd say a lot of your, your growth kind of came from word of mouth, whether it's someone sharing a post or literally just telling someone else about your account. Yeah. Um, did you use any kind of like collaboration stuff? Is there any other strategies that you used outside of that to kind of grow your business or your personal accounts? No, it's really only been content focused. So never did ads, never did like giveaways or I don't know, all that kind of stuff. I don't even know what everyone's doing these days. But uh, but no, it's really just been my content that people just saved and kept coming back to. And, you know, indeed the word of mouth online as well as offline. Um, and yeah, I did have a few viral pieces of content, but again, it's because people watch it until the end or people save it or, you know, and then it gets pushed by Instagram, of course. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be the main thing. Like no matter the algorithm, you do want to make sure that people are talking about you. Mm. Got it. And so from the, from the viral pieces that you had, what was that content about? Did you see any trends about like, Hey, when I create stuff around these topics or when I create the content in this style, was there any trends that you saw amongst all of the posts that did really well on your accounts? Mm, they were very often Instagram related. People love Instagram on Instagram. <laughs> like it's really <laughs> like, because I talk, you know, about content marketing, about business sales and Instagram, and it's usually the Instagram content that really, you know, performs the best. Mm -hmm. 
um you know it's like the top, top 10 contents always um but other than that i can't really say that there's a format i've had you know a reel for example yeah having over a million views but you know it, it was a tutorial people like tutorials and then it's very actionable i think that would be the main takeaway but i've also had carousels that did very well so obviously the sort of slideshow type of content um so mm -hmm. i don't think like everyone always says i need reels to grow i do agree that reels is an amazing tool and and, and I, I completely believe in short form video content for the future but I don't think you need it to grow. I, I sometimes today grow better with my carousels and reels. So I think what you need is just very actionable content that makes people think and that stands out that, you know, whether it's through your design or through your storytelling or through the way of maybe bringing your message across. Um, I think that is, is just way more impactful than the specific format or even the song that you put on your reel or you know, things like that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very interesting. So you'd say kind of carousel ads tend to deliver a bunch of value quite easily and then reels and then like regular posting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think for me, but that's again my account. And I think to anyone listening, like if you want to find out what's working best for your account, look at your insights, right? Look at, you know, if there's a period where your carousels are performing better than any other type of content, maybe hone down a bit on those and then, you know, do more carousels than anything else. If it's your reels, stick to reels um i've had mm -hmm. moments that my reels were performing amazing and the rest not so much and now it's actually the opposite it's carousels performing well single posts and reels a bit less and then i just listen to that uh so yeah. so yeah, it really depends a bit i do think there's phases of, of what you know works and doesn't work for your audience maybe people sometimes get sick of a format as well so that's why it's good to keep testing as well mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then for some few key metrics for people to look at, I know, you know, these social platforms have thousands of metrics that you can look at. What are some, what are maybe like the top three metrics you think are important for growing an account? I think it depends on what your goal is. If it's indeed like growing an account, going viral and stuff, then I would say um, saves is a big one because, you know, saves indicates that people find your content very valuable and they want to come back to it later. So your reach is constantly going to be increasing. Um, mm -hmm. shared is, and also I do feel like every time I have a lot of saves on a piece of content, that piece of content starts performing very well on explore or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. that shares obviously amazing, you know, Instagram will love it that people are sharing your content. That's always free reach as well. Um, and then more than likes, I would even say comments cause it shows that you're starting a conversation. Um, mm -hmm the likes and stuff i mean that's a vanity metric you hear it a lot but it, it very much is true as well but why i said it depends on what your purpose is because you can have content that is based on growth of course this is what i just went over but you could also have content that's you know more focused on selling you know especially if you're a business you're gonna have certain pieces of content that go out to get website clicks you know you you're probably not gonna get a lot of likes you're definitely not gonna go viral and get a lot of follows from it but your purpose with that piece of content is to, let's say, sell some courses. Um, so then, mm -hmm. of course, it would be more website tabs, um, possibly pro profile visits, because that means that people are intrigued and they want to check out maybe your story highlights or maybe DM you or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then what's your take on conversations in the comment section? Do you, are you one of the people who replies to every single comment? Do you kind of actively try and create conversations or do you just naturally let it happen? What's your, what's your take? So I, I mean, I, if it's really personal for, I, I'm not going to say this is the best way, but what I do is I answer every comment because that's the way I've been raised. I have to be nice and polite and say, thank you. I don't start a conversation in the comments cause I don't have that much free time either, but I do really thank people for being there. Um, and I also think it's a form of inspiration, like for me, because they're in the past, like we've had a team and in the past we've had our social media manager actually answer the comments and we recently decided to do that our ourselves again because it actually keeps a closer connection with your audience because it helps me realize mm -hmm. oh people got stuck on this specific thing in the carousel so maybe for my next piece of content i have to be careful that you know this is better explained or people are asking questions in the in the caption uh, in the comments so that might maybe inspire me for a new piece of content so I do think being a bit on top of your comment section, whether you want to answer every message or not, like me, honestly, that's up to you, but at least having a look at it 
is important because mm-hmm. your community is everything on on Instagram, especially. Um, and you do want to make sure that you're listening, uh, and and yeah, then you can of course adapt your strategy based on that. No, it's great advice. Um, yeah, it's interesting seeing some brands or even personal brands whether they use themselves for all of the commenting and all that sort of stuff, or whether they have a team in place to manage it. Um, so it's always interesting. Uh, we're coming up on time here, so a few more questions. Um, are there any tools or apps or software that you find just like save you a ton of time with managing either your oh. workflows or your your Instagram account, whatever it means, like uh, uh, whatever is valuable to you? Uh, any any suggestions? I mean, I I love tools. Like if I could automate something in my business, I do it. I I think this is by the way for anyone listening, like. If you have a task that you absolutely hate, do have a Google search to see if there's not a tool to simplify it because I can assure you there's pretty much a tool for anything. Um, but yeah, so I'm thinking a bit about the ones that I use the most often. We use um, Meta Business Suite to manage our Instagram accounts when it comes to answering to all those comments that I love <laughs> answering to um, and also DMs because it's a lot quicker. Um, then we use Slack with, you know, anyone we collaborate with, with the team. So I think that's an amazing collaboration tool as well. Um, absolutely obsessed with notion as well for anything within your business that you want to, you know, take notes or, or plan your days or whatever it is that you're working on. Um, I'm just having a look literally on what's open on my desktop to think of other ones that I use that I would highly recommend. I think also Loom is a good one. Like it might not, Loom is basically the screen recording and, and um, you know, like making sure that you don't have to have a meeting for everything. Even within our mm-hmm. team, we made a whole sort of online course for team onboarding on, on Loom. So it's like, if I do one task, I'll film it. And then at least I don't mm-hmm. need to have five meetings with five different people every time I need to teach them something. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, and then obviously for content creation, Canva is a big one. Um, yeah. Or editing we use Premiere Pro or CapCut. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think those are the main ones that I use every day. Nice. And then uh, going back to kind of like your coaching and courses, do you have any like any tools that you're using for them or like are you using a Slack for that or are you using Discord? I know a bunch of people are trying to create a course plus a membership and then also using other tools to help manage their courses or, or coaching. Yeah. Is there anything specifically for that that you're using that's working really well well we are currently using kajabi i think one of the biggest ones for courses um which i mean and to be honest i'm looking at other tools right now so i don't want to be repping them too much um but yeah we've been using kajabi for two years and it's been going well but we're we're looking at our tools right now exactly for what you're mentioning the community side of things Mm -hmm. um there are i don't want to say better because i haven't tried them yet but there's other tools out there that are maybe a bit more towards indeed that sort of membership community side Mm. that could be better. Um, I know, for example, Teachable is a great platform as well. There's a platform called Circle that does that sort of community side very well as well for memberships. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm still looking into that. So yeah, Kajabi is all I can Mm -hmm. say that I've worked with and it's a great tool, but uh, the community side can, you know, have some improvements. There is definitely needed. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, well, definitely let us know what you end up finding. Okay. Um, Okay, so Laura, to wrap this up, um, you've been so you've so nice with how much value you've shared today. Um, to return it, where can people find out more about you if they're looking to maybe check out your courses, grow their Instagram account, even just get some of this amazing knowledge that you share on Instagram? Where can they check you out? What are you working on currently? What sort of projects? Um, just fill us in. Okay, so best place to follow me is definitely Instagram. It's Laura Haley. It's, uh a very difficult last name. So I would say, look at the name of the episode. I'll link it. It's H-A-L-E-Y-D-T. It's like Haley and then D-T at the end. Um, Instagram is the best place to follow me. I am also on YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn. I, I pretty much, you know, I'm on all channels, but I would say the closest relationship will be Instagram because I do stories and all of that as well. Um, and what am I working on right now? Well, we are launching a new program, um, you know, now in Q1 of this year. So that's quite exciting and it's all about passive income, working less, making more. And very much, that's you know, our, our motto is all about like getting out of the rat race and making sure that people can live a very free life, whatever that looks like for them, but at least that they have the tools to really create passive income around their knowledge. Because I think e-learning and 
the knowledge business is is just is booming business but it's also just so powerful and and people often don't realize how much knowledge they have and how valuable that is to others so that's kind of our mm. mission to to help as many people with that and uh yeah new program for that is coming out very soon awesome love it well we'll definitely make sure to link to all of this in the show notes cool. um we obviously don't want people trying to spell that so yeah <laughs> go I mean, check I out that it and... on my instagram and probably put a wait list on and all that kind of stuff guys <laughs> you've heard my strategy now so <laughs> you can you can watch it live all right well Laura, really appreciate the time thank you so much for sharing all this amazing value and yeah we'll link to all of that in the show notes and thank you so much for coming on thank you Hey guys, we put a bunch of effort into making great content for this YouTube channel. So please hit subscribe, uh, leave us a comment, hit like, and tell a few friends about it.